Howdy, folks. I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode 33 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Now, you can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 033. Now, I apologize about the quality of the last episode, but when my internet finally came back online, episode 32 did not have time to be re-recorded. So please accept my apologies, and I've got plans to deal with that in the future. Now, on this episode, we're going to talk about the legislation that has been introduced in the state legislature already, and we're going to talk about where to get information about this legislation and to learn when new legislation is filed. You can't get any better than that. But first, let's move on to the gun of the show. And the gun of the show for this episode is the Ruger SR-22. Now, when the Ruger SR-22 came out, I decided I wanted to get one. And I wasn't going to go out and order one, but I was going to pass up one if the right deal came along. Now, when I walked into the hardware store and there was one in the counter, I looked it over. Then I asked for the 4473. I filled it out. A few minutes later, my driver's license and concealed handgun license were on record on that particular 4473. My money was no longer mine, and I walked out with the Ruger SR-22. Now, on the Pro Gun Podcast, I mentioned that this gun was featured there. Well, at that time, we were doing the 1,000-round test of the Kimber Custom TLE-2. I don't remember if I got the SR-22 right before we started or right after we started. However, we were... We were either gearing up or just barely started the thousand round challenge. And we thought, well, this gun has a reputation already of being super reliable. Let's put it to the test right out of the box. No cleaning, no prep work. We're going to feed it a thousand rounds and see how it does. Well, you know what? The gun kind of surprised me. In fact, it continues to surprise me. This is the only rimfire I have ever owned that has never experienced a misfire. And I'll be honest, this gun has a relatively high round count already. It's probably uh, responsible for converting six months of our am- of our 22 a- ammunition supply into non-reloadable brass. So statistically, this gun is so reliable that it should not exist. In fact, I have a better chance of winning the lottery than this gun running as well as it has. But, you know, you occasionally see this rare anomaly where every round of ammunition that's fed to the gun functions. Now, eventually, I will get to a bad case, and the gun will have its first misfire, or failure to fire. And at that point, we'll have the first malfunction documented in the gun. And I hope that's the first malfunction. I'd hate for this gun to go back to Ruger because it's all worn out, and tell them, hey, here's an SR-22 that has never malfunctioned, but it's worn out. Can you fix it? I'd hate to do that. Because, well, they call me a liar. Or at least I hope they would. All right, let's talk a little bit about the gun from the features and technical specs point of view. The Ruger SR-22 is a very interesting piece of work. It features two different grips, two different magazine base plates for each magazine, and it features a Picatinny rail, a safety that decocks the gun when it's engaged. Other than the slide stop, the gun is fully ambidextrous, and the fixed barrel makes it extremely accurate, plus it's also easy to clean. And that's something I cannot say about any of the other Ruger pistols I own. Or at least the Ruger Rimfire pistols. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the gun itself. The model number is 3600. This I, I, this is the base model. I have a number of guns that are either special or unique, and this is not one of them other than the fact it has proven itself to be extremely reliable for a Rimfire. It's chambered in 22 long rifle, has a capacity of 10 plus 1. It's a double-action, single-action design, and as I mentioned before, when you engage the safety, it decocks the gun. Now, the sights are kind of an oddity. You see, they're a three-dot sight, but the rear sight, you can reverse the blade so they become a one-dot sight. They are fully adjustable on the rear. The front sight is drift adjustable, if I remember correctly. And I would pull the gun out and look at it to be 100% certain, but it's in my range bag. Now, materials used in the construction, it's a polymer frame with an aluminum slide. I believe the barrel is actually steel, of course, just to maintain pressure capabilities. The weight of the gun is 17 and a half ounces. MSRP is $400 as of the time that this episode was recorded. Now, it's fitting that I mentioned the SR-22 and 22 long rifle because we are going to touch on something in the legislation that revolves around the rimfire cartridge. And we'll get we'll get straight into some of that right after 
I play the little audio clip that tells you how to get the show. And once again, the show is also available on YouTube, plus everything you hear on this. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows podcast store. Of course, you can always download the show and see the show notes as well as comment by going to the website, gunrightsintexas.com. Now, we do have some listener feedback that I want to touch on before we go any further. We have a gentleman by the name of Zach Lawson. I wonder if he's somehow related to Miranda Lawson because I've received uh, emails from her. I may have, next time I hear from one of them, I may have to. But Zach posted to the website, I have listened to your podcast since you did carry talk. Wow. That was a long time ago. He goes on to say, I really miss your carry tip from that show. Any possibility of getting that back in this show? I think you have a great new formula on this one. What would it take to get you to bring back the carry talk podcast? I really think it was your best content, although I think you're doing a better job with this one. Now, Zach's out of Amarillo, Texas, and he made a point of posting that in his uh, little post. Well, I do appreciate the kind words, Zach, and I'll definitely consider bringing back the carry tip. And you know what? It could be another little 30-second promo, kind of like what I do with the uh, how to get the show and how to contact and the social media nonsense. but. You know, to be perfectly honest, I don't really plan to bring back the Carry Talk podcast. I actually considered doing just that when I rebranded this show. Instead of rebranding it as the Gun Rights in Texas podcast, I thought about rebranding it as the Carry Talk podcast and bringing that one back. The problem was that, well, I kind of put that one to rest. That was a good show. I actually did it twice. I enjoyed doing the podcast, but there was a lot there that, I really didn't want to get back into. Now, with that said, I do miss the I do miss doing that show, but this show actually gives me a chance to do a lot of the same stuff. Plus, it lets me focus on the state of Texas and the politics, which we can't avoid right now. Right now, we are in the opening days of the political season for the Texas legislature. I can't take time away from dealing with covering that to turn around and do a third podcast because, well. Hopefully, I will be releasing an episode of the Pro Gun Podcast with Ray very soon. All right, well, let's get back to uh, our topic. And first thing I want to do is, before I actually go into the topic proper, I'm going to touch on where you can go to get some more information. Now, of course, you can uh, you can get information from the Texas State Rifle Association. And all you got to do in order to do that is join them. Or you can follow Alice Tripp on uh, Twitter. Now, on Twitter, Alice is at A-G-T-R-I-P-P. There's two P's in her last name. Now, if you follow that uh, Twitter account, you will get to hear from Alice herself, and you'll understand some of the stuff that she's going through that she can talk about. There's things she she does that she can't talk about, but that's all part of the whole political system. And if you're not a member of the TSRA, I think you really should be. I'm just saying. I will not say if I am or am not. I'll pull a C.J. Grisham there. I may or may not be a member, but you know what? Enough of that. I don't want to talk about C.J. any more than I have to. Now, another website I want to suggest is the Texas Firearms Coalition. Now, that website is texasfirearmscoalition.com, and there's a, uh, there's a section where there's a literal bill status report. I respect the gentleman that runs that website and that organization. His name is Charles Cotton. Those of you who listen to this podcast probably recognize that name and know who he is. If you don't, well, let's just say there are heavy hitters in the gun rights world that really are not that well known, and he's one of them. Now, in addition to the Texas Firearms Coalition, Charles also runs the Texas CHL Forum that he has created. And that is a very good resource for the legislative information. You can actually see a bill get ripped apart, put back together, and analyzed right there on those forums. People will be discussing it, and it's a higher caliber of discussion than most forums. The moderators, the administration, they all do a magnificent job of keeping the forum clean. If you're going there just for the political information, you'll want to scroll down to the bottom of the website, 
and I don't know, but you may have to be a registered member to actually see it. You know what? I can find out real quick. I opened up a private, pa- uh, a uh, not private, but the uh, incognito tab, not tab, but an incognito browser window. That means I'm not logged in on that one. Hit page down, legislative, 2015 legislative session, open carry discussions, prior session, 2005-2013. And there's a federal section as well. Below that is a an elections block with 2014 elections and prior year elections. Guess what, folks? You don't have to be a member to actually be able to read it. If you really, really want to get knowledgeable about what's going on in the legislature, this forum is probably one of the best places to go. So, psra.com, join them, follow at AG Trip on Twitter, uh, go to texasfirearmscoalition.com, find the bill status report, go to texaschlforum.com, and then the other links that I'm going to give you, they're all from the state of Texas or things that are covering the state of Texas. I'm going to give you two Twitter accounts, at T-X-L-E-G-E-B-I-L-L-S, that's uh, for the Texas legislative bills, or legislature bills. I don't know why they did L-E-G-E, but they did. And then there's the at T-X underscore legislature. Both of these accounts tweet out information about bills and bill updates and things like that. And the third and final link, it's kind of a hard one, and all this will be links in the show notes, okay? But the final resource to find out about a bill is the state legislature's website, www.legis.state.tx.us, and then it's slash uppercase H O M E dot A S P X. The only uppercase character in the whole thing is the H. And I'll have that link on the website so you can go there and follow it from there. That website, of course, is gunrightsintexas.com. All right. I've kind of did the told you where to go to get the information and I'm going to go ahead. I want to play the social media promo. And after that, we'll actually get into talking about the bills. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at Gun Rights NTX. On Facebook and Google Plus, it is Gun Rights in Texas. So please be social. Well, we have a bunch of firearms related bills that we're going to talk about. And before I go any further, let me just say I'm not going to give you my position on these. I might tell you some of my opinions on some of it, but I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm not, or not my opinion, I'm not going to give you my position on these bills. Instead, I'm going to give you the Texas Firearms Coalition position. And the reason I'm going to give you that position instead of my own is that the Texas Firearms Coalition, thanks to Charles Cotton, has inside information that I do not have. And Charles is an expert at playing the political game. He works closely with Alice Tripp. He works closely with Tara Micah from the NRA. And you can't get any more insider than that. So my position may or may not be conducive to actually getting results. The Texas Firearms Coalition's position will be a little more effective. All right, so let's talk about these bills. House Bill 92. Now, this one's brought up because it touches Texas Penal Code Section 46.02. It's not a gun bill. It's a knife bill. The bill was filed by White. I don't have too much more information. On most of these, I just put the last name of the person that filed it because that's what's in the bill. And this bill basically relates to the definition of an illegal knife. Essentially, what the bill does is that it removes the Bowie knife from the list of illegal knives. The Texas Firearms Coalition's position on this is neutral. In my opinion, something like this is not a bad idea because, you know, Jim Bowie died at the Alamo, and yet the knife that carries his name is illegal in Texas. Hmm, what about that? Basically, it's not a gun bill, so they're going to be neutral on it. House Bill 106, filed by Flynn. It's an open carry bill, license required. Now, there's four open carry bills as of this recording. By the time this, uh, by the time you hear this, there could be even more than that. I'm almost willing to bet there'll be at least two more bills filed in this session for open carry, and more than that could happen. Still, 
All right, this particular bill modifies a Texas Penal Code Section 30.6, and in my opinion, that's a no-go. It all When it modifies 30.6, it changes it so that written notice simply indicating 30.6 is adequate. I don't know if that applies to the signage. I really didn't pay too much attention to that because once it started going in tinkering with 30.6, I lost all interest in that bill. Now, it does define an unconcealed handgun as a handgun in a shoulder or belt holster that is wholly or partially visible. It does require dual points of resistance, and in my opinion, that's a sketchy definition at best. Now, to be perfectly honest, this bill looks like it was written using the open carry bill introduced in the last two sessions as a template for this bill. In my opinion, the fact that it touches 30-06 is a no-go for this bill. However, the Texas Firearms Coalition's position on the bill is oppose it. And I'm kind of I'm kind of giving you my position on the bill when I tell you what my opinion is, but don't listen to what I'm saying about my my opinion except to use it to form your own position. If you're going to choose anybody's position to run with the bill, go with the Texas Firearms Coalition's position. They know more about this game than I do. House Bill 118 This one was filed by Flynn as well. This particular bill would waive the fee for hunting and fishing licenses for some military personnel. In essence, the bill removes the fee for a combined hunting and fishing license for disabled veterans and active duty military personnel. Texas Firearms Coalition's position on this bill is neutral. So my position on this bill is, basically, it's a good thing to do that for these people because the cost of these licenses can get quite expensive. And, you know, these people are going out there, they are either, they're going out there and they're putting their lives on the line for our freedom. And for that, we owe them something. Let's make their lives a little easier wherever we can. So let's move on to House Bill 152. Now, this bill is not a firearms bill, but it allows for the voter regulation of fireworks. And because it does that, it touches sections of the penal code that would open it up to hostile amendments to range protection and preemption. Texas Firearms Coalition has a position on this bill of neutral. However, they warn you to watch for hostile amendments. In my opinion, the voters do have a right to decide things. However, if it comes right down to it, I'm going to lean towards killing this bill if it gets amended in a hostile manner. Not that I don't want people to have the right to vote on something. It's that if it removes our range protection or preemption capability or protections that we have already defined in the law, well, it's bad. It's very bad. House Bill 153 is also by Harless, and it's a similar bill that relates to the noise regulation by certain counties. As with HB 152, it could be amended to damage rain protection and preemption. TFC's position on this one is the same as it is on 152, which is neutral, but watch for hostile amendments. It's not a gun bill, but it could be turned into one. And then we get to House Bill 164. House Bill 164 by James White of Tyler. How the heck did I get that much of his information on there? I don't know. Maybe that's what showed up in the bill and I just simply typed it in here as well. However, this bill relates to open carry with a license. Now, it creates a penal code section 30.7 for licensed open carry. It also defines an unconcealed handgun as a handgun in a shoulder holster or a belt holster that is wholly or partially visible. One problem I have with this bill is that it keeps talking about categories, which we kind of stripped that out in the last session. If this bill adds those back in, in my opinion, it's backwards progress. Is it worth that backwards progress to get open carry? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know about that yet, but we'll see. However, like HB 106, it looks like this bill was written using the OC bill introduced in the last two sessions as a template. It's just this one was done a little better with the whole not touching penal code 30-06 and the TFC position on the bill is supported. Once again, go with the, T- go with the TFC's position and not my own. Just saying. House Bill 172. Filed by Stickland, this is uh, the gentleman that introduced one of the other open carry bills that we'll get to in a moment. Now, it expands preemption to weapons from just firearms and air guns. 
This particular bill adds protection for electric stun guns, knives, and personal defense sprays to the preemption law. You know, it does add an unnecessary provision, and that provision does have the potential to hurt range, protect, range protection. Blah, getting tongue-tied. Now, this bill could be fixed if what it does with uh, Texas government code, no, that's Texas local government code, section 229.001, subsection B, and it creates uh, subsection B10. However, if that addition that it would create was removed from it, it'd be a good bill. Texas Firearms Coalition's position on the bill is oppose it, but if the proposed uh, language in 229.001B10 is removed, then that would change. So let's move on to our next bill, which is House Bill 176. Now, House Bill 176, I am probably going to pronounce this guy's last name incorrectly, so please forgive me. However, it was filed by Kleinschmidt, and it relates to Second Amendment protection. Now, essentially, this is a Firearms Freedom Act for Texas. Texas Firearms Coalition's position on the bill? Support it. And then we have House Bill 195. I'm going to give you my opinion straight up on this bill. This is Open Carry Texas and the National Association for Gun Rights Bill. As a general rule, anything that is associated with both these groups, in my opinion, is suspect. However, my opinion really doesn't matter, and we're going to look at the bill itself. The bill is... The bill was filed by Stickland again, and it relates to constitutional carry, as they call it, or as I prefer, unlicensed carry. Now, the bill removes restrictions on the carry of handguns, illegal knives, clubs, and so forth. The bill also strikes 46.035A, and then it modifies 46035 to, so that it applies to anyone carrying a handgun. It would require 30-06 notice in order to prohibit carry at a correctional facility, hospital, amusement park, church, or government meeting. Since 30-06 does not apply to unlicensed carry, there would, in my opinion, this bill would leave no prohibitions for unlicensed people to carry at those locations. Now, even if it's fixed, this would still... Permit carry by the public inside correctional facilities unless they post 30-06. And while I don't have a problem with that personally, you'll probably see that as an excuse to amend the bill. But if it's done right, the bill gets fixed, that can be amended and left alone or amended with a fix for the other things I've noticed, and I think it'd be okay. Now, the bill creates a uh, 4615K, which would read, notwithstanding any other provision of this chapter or any other law to the contrary, no person shall be required to obtain any license to carry a handgun as a condition for being able to carry handguns openly or concealed in the state of Texas, except a person who is prohibited from possessing a handgun under 18 United States Code, Section 922. Now, 4615 would be in the penal code and subsection K would be new. Now, the bill would also modify the authority of a peace officer to disarm an armed citizen. It would expand the codified authority to apply to anyone, not just a license holder. It would raise the standard for, to disarm from reasonably believes to probable cause that the person poses an immediate threat to themselves, the officer, or a third party. It amends the language... Uh, let's see here. It says the mere possession of carrying a firearm openly or concealed with or without a concealed handgun license shall not constitute probable cause for a peace officer to, to disarm or detain an otherwise law abiding person. And that would be appended to the end of the government code 411 207 subsection a. Now, you know, this probably should be added as a new section 411.207 B or similar. But I'm not somebody that does this professionally, and I do have questions, in my opinion, I do have questions about the people that wrote the bill being professional on this as well. And apparently, when I said uh, as a 207B, I may have made a mistake because, of, you know, the bill does other things as well, such as 411-207B and 411-207C are not modified so they apply to everyone and not just license holders. Hmm. So I guess uh, maybe instead of 411-207-B, it should be added on as 411-207-A1. Now, this bill would require 
or this bill would remove the requirement to display a license upon demand for ID. And one funny thing I'd like to point out about the bill, it has seven sections. It's a small bill, and they're numbered one through six. And this is one of the reasons I question the professional capabilities of whoever wrote the bill, because you have two section fives. Well, like I said, don't listen to my opinion on the bill. Go with the Texas Firearms Coalition's position, and their position on the bill is support it. Now then, we have House Bill 198. This bill was filed by Huberty. I hope I didn't mispronounce that too badly. It allows school board members and superintendents to carry out meetings of the school board. My opinion is that this bill is basically special privileges for those more equal than others. It could be amended for positive results, such as campus carry, I believe. I'm not 100% sure about that, but it could be. But you know what? That doesn't matter because the TFC's position on the bill is opposed. It. So let's move on to House Bill 206. It was filed by Leach, and it's a sales tax holiday for firearms. Now, essentially, this would be kind of like the uh, school supply tax holiday. It would eliminate sales tax on firearms and hunting supplies for the last full weekend of August. In other words, right before dove season and new hunting licenses are available, you would be able to go and buy a new gun or any hunting supplies without paying a state sales tax. I like that. I really do. And in my opinion, that's a good idea. Other states have it, and it does them well. However, the Texas Firearms Coalition position on the bill, and this is important because their position is more important than mine, is neutral. Hmm. So let's move on. Let's take a look at House Bill 216. Now, this one was filed by James White of Tyler, and it reduces the age of the CHL to 18 years old. In my opinion, if this doesn't hurt us on reciprocity, it's a great idea. If it does hurt us on reciprocity, maybe we should consider other things. However, if you go to the Texas CHL forum, you will see a little bit of a discussion on this bill or the idea of reducing the age of the CHL or the age for a CHL. And the Texas Firearms Coalition does not have a position listed on the bill as of this moment. And I will check that just to make sure that it hasn't changed since I created my show notes. In fact, I don't even see the bill listed there, so... Maybe that's why they don't have a position. It may have been overlooked and their position is just not up there. Or they may not have caught it. But I think Charles has uh, commented on that bill. So go to the Texas CHL forum and you can probably find out a discussion along this subject. Probably even that bill itself. Now the next bill we're going to talk about is House Bill 223. And I'm going to mispronounce this guy's name. There's no two ways about it. I want to give it two attempts at pronunciation. Now, I'll mispronounce it at least once and possibly twice. The bill was filed by Gillen or Gian, and I want to refer to it as the Tasty Pastry Protection Bill. Now, this bill protects students from kindergarten through grade five. It prevents a school from expelling students for possessing or brandishing foods shaped like a weapon, possessing or brandishing plastic toy weapons less than two inches in length, possessing or brandishing plastic toy weapons made from building blocks, Utilizing hands or fingers to simulate weapons, vocalizing weapons, drawing weapons, and pretending school supplies are weapons. These are all normal things that kids do. And the Tasty Pastry Protection Bill would protect those children from the school. In my opinion, we need to pass this bill for the children. The Texas Firearms Coalition's position is support it. So, once again, listen to the TFC's position and not my opinion. Now, I don't recall what the real name of the bill is, but I'm referring to it as the Tasty Pastry Protection Bill, simply because that's disarming and it gives it a cute, fuzzy, warm name. Okay, let's move on. Let's still take a look at House Bill 226. House Bill 226 is also by uh, the same gentleman that filed House Bill 223. So I'm not going to mispronounce his name again. You just go back if you want to hear me mispronounce it. It's a podcast. You can scroll, not scroll, but you can rewind it a little ways. It ain't going to hurt. You know, it creates a civil penalty for prohibiting CHLs from carrying on government property. This creates a penalty for the first offense of $1,000 to $1,500. It creates a penalty for additional violations of $10,000 to $10,500. Each continuing day of the offense con constitutes a separate violation. Oh, that's interesting. It also clarifies Penal Code Section 46035C in regards to license holders. And 
it really does need an amendment to support private litigation. In my opinion, this is a good bill. It needs to be done. And the amendment to allow private litigation needs to be done. So this is a good bill in my opinion. And if we don't get a better version of it, let's get this one passed. Now, the Texas Firearms Coalition on this bill, their position is support, but amendment demanded. And the amendment demanded would be the private litigation amendment. So let's move on to House Bill 278 by Ashby. Now, this bill allows certain attorneys representing the the state of Texas to open carry. Once again, we have a bill that would allow special privileges for those more equal than others. And that's my opinion, but you can kind of see why. Now, the Texas Firearms Coalition's position on this bill is oppose it. So listen to them. Even if it conflicts with my position, listen to the TFC because they're kind of plugged into the political game. They know they know things that we don't, and they may be able to get results and use bad bills for good and good bills better. However, my opinion and theirs on a lot of these bills are the same, just like this one. So let's move on to the next bill, House Bill 284. This one was filed by Springer and it relates to license proficiency requirements. This particular bill does have a companion bill in the Senate. And basically, it's a short bill. All it does is it reduces the minimum caliber from 32 to 22. That means you can go and qualify with a Ruger SR-22 like the one we had in the start of the show if this bill is passed. Now, people may be wondering why a companion bill is so important. Well, when you have a companion bill, if both houses pass the same bill, They go, if there's no changes, they go straight to the governor's desk. If there's a change in one of them, they basically go to a conference committee, get ironed out, both houses vote on the revised version, and hopefully they go to the governor's desk from there. And I may have that mixed up a little bit with with the federal system, but I think it applies to the Texas system too. All right, the Texas Firearms Coalition's position on the bill, support it. House Bill 291, this one was filed by Huberty. 291 relates to licensed open carry. Mm -hmm. This bill is very similar, if not identical, to House Bill 106. I went a little ways into it, and basically I said, this is too much like 106, it's bad, and I lost all interest. The Texas Firearms Coalition's position on the bill is oppose it. Now we have Senate Bill 107. We're getting into the Senate bills. There's only like three left, counting this one. This one was filed by Whitmore, or not Whitmore, but Whitmire. This particular bill relates to the education code and firearms. It would remove the codified basis for expelling a student based on the possession of a firearm. Um, I'm kind of torn on this one. I need to look at it in more detail. I found it this morning right before I started putting the show notes together, so I really haven't had time to look at it. And the Texas Firearms Coalition, it's not on their website, so basically I don't even know where they stand on that bill. And then we have Senate Bill 124. This bill was filed by West. Now, Senator West is a very anti-gun senator in the state of Texas. And this bill relates to the unlawful transfer or purchase of firearms. It has vague language that could be used to trap people. And in all honesty, I believe this is the first step to universal background checks for the state of Texas. In my opinion, this bill needs to be killed and killed with prejudice. Knock this thing down so hard that it never comes back up. If we do that, Senator West and everybody else will say, hey, that bill came down, it hurt our political capital, and we're not going to try it again. That's what this bill needs, in my opinion. The Texas Firearms Coalition, their position is, oppose it. And really, with the Texas Firearms Coalition, you get support, support with amendments, neutral, neutral but watch for amendments oppose and oppose but if amended we will possibly change our mind and uh so their system you really get like six options and uh, they don't have nuke it from orbit as an option but in my opinion that's what this bill needs and then we have senate bill 179 which is as i said a companion bill to senate bill 284 And what they do is, as I said, they reduce the minimum caliber for qualification on a CHL from 32 to 22. So, basically, we know the TFC supports this bill because they supported HB 284. Now then, uh, 
this episode's getting kind of long in the tooth already. And you know what? We're going to go ahead. We're going to do the contact promo and then we're going to wrap the show up. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. All righty, we're going into the news. Now, this particular news story is coming to us from Austin, Texas, and a gun store called the Central Texas Gunworks possibly prevented what could have easily become a mass shooting when a recently released psych patient came in asking to buy a gun and ammunition. Now, an alert public ready to prevent this kind of tragedy or stop it is the best way to avoid the horrors of a mass shooting. In this case, we have evidence of it. Nobody was shot. Nobody was killed. And a mass shooting was probably prevented if the guy's uh, story is 100% true. He may not have gone through it. He may have. But he was a psych patient. He was wanting to go back to the hospital and kill people. And he went so far as to try and get a weapon to do it. The good news is he went to the gun store and they kind of shut him down until the police got there. And the police, well, they took him down and then they took him to jail. So basically, everything worked out for the best. Now, if I'm not mistaken... Uh, one of the gentlemen involved in the store, maybe even the owner himself, is involved in the open carry movement. Now, how about that? A gun store owner, a gun store employee, and they're not mm, crazy people that want to help kill everybody. Did Moms Demand Action lie to us? Hmm. Maybe we ought to start fact-checking everything they say. Or we can do like I do and say, eh, they're probably lying. Or twisting the facts. Now, this next story... And this next one's kind of a special case. We have a story coming to us from San Antonio, Texas, where a situation developed that a CHL holder stopped a robbery without firing a shot. The suspect did flee the scene. However, no one was injured and the robbery suspect did not get any money. Now, rather than point you to a news article about the event, I want to point you to a forum post on the Texas CHL forum where the license holder posted about it himself. That's right. The good guy with the gun that stopped the robbery posted about it on the Texas CHL forum. And in his original post, there's two articles linked that are about the shooting. You can't get any better than that. You get a firsthand account from the person that actually experienced the event. And that link will be in the show notes. I do have one more news story before we end the show. And this one is in the guns and ranges category. Now, If you'll recall, I mentioned House Bill 152 and House Bill 153 could be amended to hurt range protection and our preemption laws. And this story kind of plays into that. You see, this story has a headline, Are Texas Gun Range Regulations Strong Enough? The article is basically a piece about a range being built by the uh, Dogwood Hills Gun Club. Now, the article talks about what went into designing and building the range. However, keep the headline in mind when you call your representatives, when you call your senators, and you're talking about House Bills 152 and 153. If they get amended, it's because of headlines like these and people that think like this headline. With that said, I'm going to wrap the show up and basically stay safe, carry responsibly, and our new to Texas or new to Texas gun ownership segment will be after the music and if you don't want to hear it that's okay just stop the podcast you've already got the meat and potatoes thank you for listening to the gun rights in texas podcast please leave a review on itunes or send feedback to the host your input will be used to improve the show stay safe and please carry responsibly All right. Well, I'm going to cheat on this one. The new to gun ownership in Texas segment. Well, we're not really going to talk about guns that much. We're going to continue our political discussion. If you're new to gun ownership, you're new to gun politics, and you really 
want to protect your investment, you want to protect your property, well, guess what? That's what this episode's all about. In this episode, I mentioned uh, the TSRA as, a TSRA as a resource for getting information. I mentioned the Texas Firearms Coalition. I mentioned the Texas CHL Forum. I mentioned the Texas legislative Twitter accounts. I mentioned the Texas legislature's website. Go there. Learn as much as you can about these bills. And then when the session starts, push for the bills that you want. Push for the bills that protect yourself. Push for the bills that protect your property and your rights to your property. Don't sit back and expect anybody else to do this for you. You have to go out. You have to do this because if you don't and the guy next to you don't and the guy next to him doesn't and nobody next to anybody does, nobody protects your rights. But if you do it and you convince the guy next to you to do it and you convince him to convince the one next to him to do it and they convince the one next to them to do it and so on, you now have an army of people supporting your rights. And that's what we're about. The gun rights movement is more grassroots than anybody can imagine. We're not AstroTurf. We're real grassroots. And with that said, stay safe and carry responsibly.